right, so let's talk about SIL verification. So we're going to look at safety and semantic functions. We're going to talk about specifying target safety integrity levels and then how we calculate uh, achieved safety integrity levels. So first of all, uh, when, we, when we talk about functional safety um, and we look at the uh, IC61511, uh, there's a nice definition, part of the overall safety relating to the process and the basic process control system, which depends on the correct functioning of the safety and cemented system and other protection layers. Graphically, a lot easier to understand. With your process, there is a certain level of risk. Our hazards, there's a ha and, and there's a certain level of risk associated with that hazard. And that risk may be greater than what you can tolerate. So if that process risk is greater than your tolerable risk, you need risk reduction. And uh, a minimum level of risk reduction will be to just hit that tolerable risk level. Uh, if you deploy something uh, that's called the as low as reasonably practical uh, concept, there may be something that's an optimal risk reduction. But the key here is to see that there's many ways that we can accomplish that risk reduction. And uh, quite often, especially since we're talking SIL verification here, we will always talk about safety and some manner functions that will provide risk reduction. But there's many ways to achieve risk reduction. Uh, we can have, we can make changes to the process. So if we, uh, if, if there is lower quantities of explosive materials, then our explosions will be smaller and maybe our uh, effect zones will be, will be smaller. Or you know, we could make changes to our overall design of our process. If leaking pipes is an issue, maybe we want to use dual wall piping. Uh, we may have a control system that implements an interlock function. We may have an operator responding to an alarm as a, a way to prevent a certain scenario. Uh, if it's a high pressure event, we may have a relief device that, uh, that releases pressure from, from a particular vessel. All of these can, can achieve uh, risk reduction. Um, and then finally, if, if, if we don't have enough risk reduction after taking all of these into consideration, uh, we can implement the safety instrument function to, to tackle the rest. But as you can see from the, from the graph, you know, if, if this relief uh, reduction would just be a little bit larger, we wouldn't need a safety instrument function. So by, by no means am I advocating that we should always use safety instrument functions, even though that's what we will focus on for the next two days. When we talk about a safety instrument function, we'll see that as well when we start to, uh, to model um, we need to make sure that we look at all the equipment that is needed to detect the hazard and bring the process to the safe state. So the safety and semantic function is, is expected to achieve or maintain a safe state with regard to a, a specific hazardous event. Um, so that could be um, that, we, um, you know, that we detect pressure and if pressure gets too high, that we close an inlet valve. Sometimes there's a bunch of extra activities that we want to take into consideration or that we want to do once we try to achieve the safe state because there could be some uh, upsets uh, at other parts of our process. But if those other actions are not necessary to achieve the safe state, they're not part of our safety and cement function. I'm not saying they're not important, so you may want to sound an alarm. You may want to um, you know, uh, send out a warning to, uh, to an upstream process or start shutting down an upstream process because you know you're going to miss your feed. But that's not necessarily protection against the hazard at hand. So we always need to make sure that we're not including any auxiliary equipment. And we'll have some examples of that uh, later as well. When we talk about safety and semantic functions, those are individual functions that protect against specific hazardous event. They are part of an overall safety and cemented system. And that safety and cemented system will consist of many safety and cemented functions, or at least one, but typically many safety and cemented functions. And those safety and cemented functions um, you know, could look something like this, where I have a sensor, 
operating a valve, another function that has different sensors operating the same valve, and so on. And in this case, we even have a sensor being shared. Uh, obviously, we, we tend to ignore the fact that the logic solver is usually part of all safety instrumental functions. That's not a problem. Each function is intended to protect against a specific hazardous event, and those hazardous events uh, are independent of each other, so we can share equipment. Um, but once we do share equipment, we always need to realize that if there's multiple SIFs, multiple SIL levels, that equipment will always need to meet that highest SIL level. So why do you see most safety PLCs being certified to SIL 3? Well, it tends to be part of all safety functions. If there's just one safety function that needs to meet SIL 3, that logic solver will need to meet SIL 3. Examples of this, let's say you have a burner system. This is my fuel valve. High pressure in the fuel will cause closing of the fuel valve. Uh, maybe loss of flame, close the fuel valve. Uh, maybe uh, loss of instrument air close to fuel valve and so on. So quite often we have uh, you know, a single fine element part of multiple functions. Uh, for, for the sensors, we could have a, uh, let's say, a, a, a low pressure measurement that does something and a high pressure measurement that does something else with the same, uh, with the same uh, sensor or, or let's say overfill and, and dry run. Uh, if we can measure that with the same level a measurement, different actions, uh, but we're using the same instrument. So when we talk about safety and some manner functions, there are always a single set of actions and corresponding equipment to identify a single hazardous event and bring that to the safe state. We will assign SIL levels to individual SIFs. We don't assign SIL levels to the entire safety and some manner system, always to the individual SIL, uh, always to the individual SIF. When it comes to um, determining your target SIL level, we're talking about this top phase of uh, this first phase of the, of the life cycle, this analysis phase, where we do our PHA, our LOPA, and SIL selection. And then in the middle phase, the design and implementation, that's where we do our SIL verification. And um, so what are some of the tasks that we do in the analysis phase? We do a process hazard analysis, brainstorm and identify potential uh, hazards in the conceptual design of the plant. Uh, we do the layer of protection analysis or risk graph or risk matrix to identify potential protection layers as well as identify overall risk levels. And then we do SIL selection to specify the specific integrity requirements that the safety and cement function needs to meet. And we document all that in a safety requirement specification. And that safety requirement specification will be the input into uh, the design uh, of the safety and cement function. And one of the key requirements, of course, is going to be that SIL level, but other requirements uh, are are obtained from earlier phases in the life cycle, including the PHA, where you're defining what is the hazard, what do I need to detect, uh, and if you have process safety information, uh, you know, what, what is the, you know, for example, the process safety time, or what are the operating ranges of my, uh, of my parameter, uh, of, my, uh, of my SIF. Once we um, get to the point where we do our, our LOPA uh, or our risk graph or risk matrix, um, we, we calculate the amount of risk reduction that is necessary. Um, and in, in simple terms, uh, we calculate the required risk reduction factor, or the target risk reduction factor, by dividing the uh, hazardous event frequency by the tollable frequency. Um, that's the typical approach uh, that we see nowadays. Uh, I'd say 90% of our customers use LOPA as a SIL, or as a basis of SIL selection. Um, there's still a couple of people out there that use the risk graph and risk matrix, uh, but where, let's say in 2003, 2004 time, it was probably 100% using risk graph and risk matrix. Nowadays, everybody tends to 
simply use LOPA. But what, uh, what you see when you do a layer protection analysis, uh, you will look at the consequences of a hazardous event. That will dictate your tollable frequency. And then you can calculate your actual frequency in front, uh, by dividing one over the, by, by the other. You can calculate that target risk reduction factor. And for low demand applications, that target risk reduction factor uh, relates to a safety integrity level. So when we calculate a risk reduction factor in, uh, in, in let's say, LOPA, uh, if the risk reduction factor is greater than 10, less than 100, that falls in the SIL-1 range. Greater than 100, less than 1,000, SIL-2. Greater than 1,000, less than 10,000, uh, SIL-3, and so on. This is how the standard defines the risk reduction factors. Um, and you can see, if you look at these, that the risk reduction factor is 1 over uh, P of the average. Um, so for SIL-1, the P of the average needs to be less than 10 or minus 1. For SIL-2, less than 10 or minus 2, and so on. That's why this is greater than 10 and greater than 100. Typically, if you end up with a risk reduction factor of 100, people will say that that is a SIL-2 target. Uh, in, in our LOPA tool, you can actually, uh, or in our SIL selection tool in the LOPA, you can actually specify if you want this to be a greater than or a greater than equal uh, operand. Um, but anyway. Also, something else to keep in mind, if you use LOPA, uh, sometimes you can calculate a required risk reduction factor of, let's say, 30. And 30 falls within this SIL-1 range. So you may be inclined to specify that your target SIL is SIL-1. But you need to be careful because a conceptual design engineer who is coming up with your safety instrument function may see that SIL-1 requirement. And he can come up with a SIF that meets a risk reduction factor of 11, which is SIL-1, uh, but which not, would not be sufficient for you because you needed 30. So if you end up with a risk reduction of 30, you can do two things. You can either specify SIL-2, which will be conservative, um, which is what the qualitative methods like risk graph and risk matrix do. Or you can specify SIL-1, but then you need to add that required risk reduction factor with the specification. So you say SIL-1 plus minimum risk reduction factor of 30. For high demand or continuous demand safety functions, we're not talking about probabilities of failure. We're not talking about um, uh, risk reduction factors, but instead we're talking about target uh, frequencies of dangerous failure uh, to, uh, for each of the SIL levels. Um, in the first edition of IEC 61508, these were called probabilities of failure per hour. So you will still find a PFH abbreviation in many publications as, as the parameter that is being calculated, as well as an excellentia. Um, but probability per hour, that's a, basically a no-no. Probabilities are dimensionless, and when you make it per hour, they're no longer dimensionless. Uh, the target frequency of dangerous failures, that's really what we are looking for. Uh, and what you can see here for SIL-1, it needs to be less than 10 to minus 5, SIL-2, 10 to minus 6, 10 to minus 7, 10 to minus 8. And there's four orders of magnitude between this set of uh, limits, and if I go back, this set of limits, and four orders of magnitude is roughly the number of hours in a year. 8,716, except when it's a leap year. Uh, so that's where the relationship comes in between low demand, high demand. Uh, we will talk about that a little bit. Uh, but um, typically for the process industry, our SIFs are all low demand application SIFs. So when we calculate the achieved SIL level, so we have our specified target SIL, when we come up with a safety instrument function, and then calculate what the achieved SIL level is of that safety instrument function, there's a couple of things that we need to take into consideration. Uh, and to be precise, a total of three different SIL levels. There's a SIL level based on the average probability of failure and demand of the entire safety instrument function. So in this case, we see a control system, we see a safety system, um, 
sensor, the logic solver, and in this case, spring actuated valve um, together build the safety instrument a function. And this average probability of failure and demand uh, relates to that entire function. And that needs to meet a certain requirement based on the syllabus. Then there is architectural constraints requirements, also known as minimum hardware fault tolerance requirements. So based on the sill level that I, I'm trying to achieve, I need to have certain redundancy levels in my, uh, in my architecture. And then finally, I need to justify the equipment that I'm using in my safety instrument of function. Um, and, uh, and as Japan was already saying, well, uh, we have some legacy systems. Most likely the products are not certified. We still need to justify why we're using that equipment in our safety and cement function. So this is where equipment capability comes into play. So the achieved sill level is going to be a minimum of the sill level based on probability of failure, minimum uh, uh, sill level based on architecture constraints, and the sill level based on systematic capability. Those are three individual sill levels that we calculate, and the lowest of the three will dictate what our achieved sill level is. And we will see that if we use generic equipment, equipment that is not certified for, uh, for sill, um, our systematic capability is going to be zero, and therefore our achieved sill level is going to be zero. But we'll, we'll work with that as we, as we go through uh, some of our exercises. And there's also a graphic on a variety of parameters and how they impact that achieved sill level. Uh, so conceptual design dictates what the hardware fault tolerance is. That has an impact on your architecture constraints, and there's some different uh, parameters here um, with regard to failure rates and experience with that failure rates that talk about architecture constraints. There's a variety of parameters that impact your probability of failure on demand. And both of these, the cell IC and the cell PFD, uh, are, are measures against random hardware failures. And you can see that there is some overlap with regard to the base uh, parameters that, that are impacting them. And then at the bottom, you can see that that systematic capability is kind of independent of all that. Um, you know, it's based on, is your product certified to 61508 or proven in use? So that's kind of what the graphic is trying to show, is there's a lot of relationship between the PFD and the architecture constraints, and the systematic capabilities kind of outside of that. So that is, a, in a nutshell, our introduction to SIL verification. And then in the next sections, we're going to go in more detail on, uh, on, on for example, the probability of failure on the architecture constraints, and so on.